we have a very big cafe here. Um, that's a huge beast to feed, right? It takes 16 people to open the doors. Um, by the time you look at the kitchen and the marketing and all that sort of stuff, it's a, it's a very, uh, very big business. And uh, my board keeps telling me it's your, it's a marketing system for you. You need to put the losses that you make in that cafe down to a marketing budget. And I went, oh, thanks very much. We don't make any money in our cafe, right? And yet on a, on a Friday, Saturday or Saturday, Sunday uh, here now, you know, we're eight, nine hundred cups of coffee a day. So, you know, um, and we are really, really struggling to do a break even on that model. This episode is proudly brought to you by Mapper Forwards Workshop. It's time to become a coffee consultant. Learn how to diversify your revenue streams and create freedom from your day job while saying goodbye to that alarm clock forever by becoming a consultant within the coffee industry or directly to consumers who have shifted towards home brewing and home roasting. Protect your income from challenging times in the coffee value chain by taking this course today. Go to mapperforward.coffee forward slash workshops or click the link in the show notes for details. Welcome to the Daily Coffee Pro by Mapper Forward Friends. I'm your host, Lee Safar, and this is episode two of a five-part series with Matt Toogood from Raw. And before we get started, I just wanted to say, folks, we are constantly sent messages from people that are saying, thank you for what you're doing on the podcast. Please keep it up. How can we support you? Uh, the podcast is amazing. All of these really wonderful messages. Um, and so what I would like to mention is how you can support this podcast. The first and easiest way is to share it with people. The second way, if you would like to kind of pay, we will never put this behind a paywall, but people keep saying, do you have a Patreon? Can we, how can we support the podcast? Yes, we have a Patreon and you can check the show notes um, and you can contribute for like as little as three bucks a, a month. Um, the other thing that we you can do is that you can become a paid member of our YouTube channel for a couple of dollars a month. All of that helps us maintain everything that we need to keep this podcast running sponsor free so that the only kinds of sponsor messages that you get on here are either uh, workshops that we're doing or events that we're running, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we do this because we want to keep the content untouchable by people who uh, may want to hijack uh, what we talk about and uh, and yeah decide what we talk about and we will never let that happen so I would I would rather get a day job than and keep this podcast going the way that it's going than allow somebody to hijack what the content is because I feel that it's too valuable to the industry so we in the last podcast uh, with you Matt we were talking about the eucalyptus situation, and you were helping us validate what Heliana said in the last series from the perspective of, one, the person who told me about it in the first place, and two, somebody who buys coffee from Ethiopia and has been doing so for a long time and went to see what Heliana was talking about after she had been telling it you as well as many other of her customers for quite a few years. In this episode of the podcast, we're going to talk about this coffee industry crisis that I've been talking about quite a lot on the podcast. Now, what as a, a business that is kind of a monumental in this region and is well known all over the world, if if I I was to ask you to tell us what the crisis that's going on is, how would you kind of sum that up? So 15 years ago, when I joined Kim with, at Raw, I you know, started me, I met her out of desperation. You know, we just moved from New Zealand and, you know, I had a rock at, at home and I used to make my coffee at home and I think I needed a gasket for it. And I found out that she was uh, selling rockets. So I met her, but the, the main thing was that I was so used to having freshly roasted coffee in New Zealand. You know, that was, I grew up my, you know, a Saturday morning, whatever C 
season it was, was, you know, hockey or cricket or, you know, rugby or whatever I was playing at the time. And my dad used to, after those uh, sporting events, we used to go past the, the Dixon Street Deli in Wellington and, you know, he'd buy coffee for the week and he'd buy some bagels and, and that was a thing. And my kids grew up like that as well, that on a Saturday we used to stop by and, you know, the, the local roastery and pick up a bag of coffee and have a chat and espresso. And, you know, so, you know, when I moved to Dubai, you know, I knew everything about coffee because I was a drinker of coffee. And so, of course, I immediately started to help Kim with all the problems that he had because I could tell her how to roast better because, you know, I've seen roasting done. Um, and, you know, what ended up happening is that, you know, just like myself, there was a lot of people who had been exposed to a quality fresh product. And so, you know, I do remember I found a, um, a can of uh, Italy espresso whole beans at the supermarket here. It was 11 months old and I thought I'd find the Holy Grail. Like that, that's how bad it had got until I'd met Kim. So, you know, we had a lot of time where it was very, very simple to get customers. What we'd do is go, here, drink this. And they'd drink it and go, why does this taste different? We'd say, well, it's really good quality. It's fresh. Um, and we know where it came from, um, you know, and so, and so do that, you know, drink that. And, you know, people were, were excited about it. You know, fast forward 15 years, that, that now has become harder and harder and harder because the consumer doesn't understand what they're actually getting because we are so bombarded by marketing material. And I wish there was a police system that could say, unless you are selling a single origin, directly traded coffee, you're not allowed to say that you are. But there's no one stopping anyone from doing that. The other thing that we've had in our industry, and I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, but Nestle is 100% responsible for the success of specialty coffee in especially the UAE. And it isn't through a product that they have with caffeine in it. They have been successful here because they produce sweet condensed milk. And the good old coffee Spanish industry. latte. <laughs> Spanish latte, yeah. Um, so the growth of specialty coffee stores in uh, the, in the UAE was given to consumers who did not like the taste of coffee. They were used to, if they did drink coffee in a traditional way, in an Arabic style, it's normally sweetened with saffron or cardamom or something like that. So the bitterness is actually covered up by by something. So you give them something that's 60 milligrams of uh, sweet condensed milk and it doesn't matter what coffee you put in there, it's going to taste like a dessert and, and, and that's, what, that's what's burned this industry here. That, that I would say that 90% of the consumers who were buying all these coffees were drinking it super sweet with milk. So that allowed the industry here to not focus on coffee quality. And it meant that they could just buy a consume, uh, consumer grade coffee um, and, uh, you know, do it. And, and, they, and the consumer was told what they're getting a specialty. And as an industry, what we did, it was absolutely fantastic. What we decided is that we weren't going to actually worry about the quality of the coffee. What we're going to do is worry about the quality of the experience. So as long as where you were going had great car parking, you know, the, um, the, the, uh, the seats that you were sitting in were comfortable and the chandelier was the most beautiful chandelier. That suddenly became a specialty coffee shop. The coffee became irrelevant. So, you know, I had, you know, I've spent my entire career doing, the coffee career doing, hoping that quality was going to be the thing that would see us through. So eventually the consumer was going to understand that quality was it. And what that meant is that we could pay more for the coffee because the consumer was happy to pay for that. That the farmers, because we trade everything direct, we don't buy anything from any traders at all anymore. Um, and I thought that that's how we were going to win. But unfortunately, it's not the case. The consumer wants something different. So you can take, um, I'll get a little bit, the, the non-coffee geeks in here, I apologize. 
but you can take an 83, 84 coffee and do a special fermentation by throwing some pineapple or some coconut or something into that fermentation tank. You could have a nice clean coffee. You can pop that out. And now that producer can sell that for three times what they were going to sell that coffee for. You know, they've put the effort in, but that's what the consumer is looking for. Is they're looking for, oh, I can take hints of strawberry. Well, that's probably because we put strawberries into the fermentation. You know, and unfortunately, that's not helping. What that's doing is enabling people who have maybe come from a Western society and moved to a production country like Panama, for example, you know, and they've got access to cash and, and, and money that they can, you know, make something that is consumable rather than good for the environment or good for their. So where I think that we're, we're running into is that we are dumbing ourselves down to accept mediocrity in the product, which means that the only winners at the end of the day are going to be the large corporate companies who work on massive, massive volumes and very, very small margins. Well, the model for the owner operator or non-corporate coffee chain is exactly opposite to that. We have to look at much smaller volume loads, um, but we need the higher margins to support ourselves. Do you think fundamentally the business model that operates today for the cafe and for the roastery, do you think that it is a viable model anymore? We spent our first eight years refusing to do anything but coffee. We, in fact, we didn't do Spanish lattes until about four years ago. And it was literally one day I walked into the, into the office and I said to Kim, we, we have to do a Spanish latte. And she said, no, we don't. And I said, no, we do. We, we're not making enough money. We're not selling enough cups of coffee. You know, that consumer that needs it sweetened to drink it. If we don't have that consumer, we're in trouble. She's, you know, and this is when we are uh, 85% of our business is B2B wholesale. And I'm already complaining about this when it was just such a small part. We have a very big cafe here. Um, that's a huge beast to feed. Right? It takes 16 people to open the doors um, by the time you look at the kitchen and the marketing and all that sort of stuff. It's a, it's a very, uh, very big business. And uh, my board keeps telling me it's, your, it's a marketing system for you. You need to put the losses that you make in that cafe down to a marketing budget. And I went, oh, thanks very much. We don't make any money in our cafe, right? And yet on a, on a Friday, Saturday or Saturday, Sunday uh, here now, you know, we're eight, 900 cups of coffee a day. So, you know, um, and we are really, really struggling to do a break even on that model. So the, the reason that raw is in existence today, especially after COVID, has come down to one something really simple, we diversify. So we have multiple ways that we get revenue in. We have B2B, we have B2C, we have roasting, we have, um, we don't sell green coffee, but we, um, you know, we have a cafe, we have an online store and we sell a lot of other products that are associated with cafes. Without all of those together, we would be in trouble if we had, if we were relying on one stream, if we were relying on roasting uh, and cafe only, no, couldn't do it. So it sounds like what you're saying to me is that the way that you've adapted is the same way that coffee producers are adapting. They've diversified and the coffee roasters and particular the businesses that are roasters and cafes, you've had to diversify your revenue streams just so that you can survive. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, we, we saw in Dubai, so we went, COVID hit us and we went from one day to losing the next day, losing 85% of our revenue, gone, closed. And, you know, so we did a couple of things. Um, one of them was to, to look at diverse revenue streams, um, you know, and things like that. And I, I tell you, we held on by our fingernails, literally held on by our fingernails. And we went into the COVID crisis with money in the bank because access to finance in the Middle East for is, is expensive. It's not viable for a small SME to, to borrow money to run a business here. Um, and we, you know, we, we were literally hanging on 
day to day cash flow forecasts every day. What, how much money have we got? What can we afford? Talking to the team, you know, so all of that stuff. So a huge amount. And I, and I know that uh, 45% of the customers that we were supplying pre COVID never reopened here. Um, you know, and, and in one way I, I sat there and went, you know what, we are actually a little bit oversaturated with cafes. So, um, it would have been, you know, it's, it's not bad that we've lost some cafes. Um, but the, the flip side is, and we did it as well, is that immediately after things sort of settled down, what did we do? Everyone just went out and opened more and more and more cafes because we thought that that was the answer. Um, and, you know, it, we had a resurgence for a little bit of time because we started to sell a lot of equipment. Again, we're starting to, you know, do a lot of training and people are ready and everybody's exciting. But there's just not enough consumers, right? There's just not enough people coming in. You know, I, I spend my day talking to um, uh, people who are wanting to open their own business or they want to have some form of F&B that the coffee is going to be involved. And, you know, I talk to them about, you know, what is your business plan? What are we doing? And they, they look at me like I'm, I'm from Mars and I'm saying, you know, well, you know, you know, what's your, the question I often ask is, you know, how many cups of coffee do you need for your business plan to work? And most people look at me like I've got three heads. Okay. What do you mean? How many cups? I said, well, you know, what does your budget tell you? Well, I don't know. How many cups will I sell? And I went, ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, I know for a small operation, say it's 30 seat cafe um, in Dubai, I know that you have to be doing, if you don't have a, a major food kitchen that's contributing to your cafe, if you're just doing food that you're buying in from somewhere else, which means that your margin is literally a quarter of what it is if you make it, um, but you don't have the overhead of a kitchen, if you're not doing 120 cups of coffee a day, you are going bankrupt. And I would say that. 90% of the coffee shops that are not big chain coffee shops here are doing way less than that. And in fact, I'm looking at models now where people are talking about doing such small volumes of stuff. I'm going, but where's your money coming from? They don't know. So, you know, what, what's happening? We've got a, a, a consumer who is confused and dumbed down. They don't know what they're drinking and what's good and what's bad. You've got um, a problem that we can't get access to high quality stuff because the farmers are not really interested or, you know, it's already been bought by somebody else. So there's not a lot of, of the high quality stuff. And then you've got business owners who are really not understanding what they need to do to be successful. They might have a beautiful place and people love going there, but uh, sustainability in my world starts at number one, which is if you can't open the doors because you can't pay your rent and your salary and your power, you're in trouble. And that's what we're starting to see now. And, what, and when you start to take, that is essentially, and thank you for, for putting it that way, that is the core of what's going on. And and then when you stack on top of that, the impacts that climate are having on different origins around the world um, with regards to, you know, the, the strain on the supply of coffee. And then you stack the cost of living crisis that consumers are experiencing and you stack on top of that an energy crisis that is also creating problems uh, for peripheral businesses or vertically integrated businesses and increasing the cost of them doing business, which is a flow on effect that's having on, on other businesses. There are so many things that are stacking one on top of the other, on top of the other, on top of the other, that in the years before this, they were just further apart. So it was harder to bring into focus how they, whether they were going to collide with each other. And now that collision, they're all close enough now that we can see that there's probably going to be a collision that happens. The collision hasn't happened yet. The crisis is there. We can see that those who can adapt and have been paying attention before now who reduce their debt, uh, running businesses, have multiple revenue streams, uh, you know, managed to secure leases for their businesses that weren't ridiculous. And they have enough of a runway still from now until whenever to run their business at a stable rent without too much debt. 
that that is going to be a key thing without too much debt. Well, those are the people who I anticipate are going to be able to survive whatever is it is that's going to happen with collusion happens. But unfortunately, we have a lot of people already going out of business. Australia is an absolute bloodbath with regards to uh, the number of cafes that are closing and uh, kind of the, the way that the whole restaurant and F&B industry is operating right now. It is an absolute bloodbath. And I can't remember if it was you or Kim that mentioned to me something similar was going on in New Zealand. Is that right? Yeah, well, Kim's just been down there, um, and so she, yeah, has noticed it. We've got friends in the coffee industry, obviously, in New Zealand, who um, are super struggling. You know, my my father um, is uh, just retired as a high court judge, and he is one of those people, and we were laughing about this the other day, he's one of those people that for his entire life, he loves going into a cafe and ordering a triple ristretto. Um and that lovely customer. Um, and I said to him, you know, what, you know, what's, what's happening with, with cafes and stuff? And he said, it's just dumbed down. Everything's just dumbed down. People are going in and drinking coffee, but it's not like they actually care where the coffee comes from. They don't care. It's just, it's a, it's a remote exercise now because the quality is becoming so poor in the sense that people can't, the roasters can't afford to spend money on coffee beans. They can't afford to buy green. And so they're just buying whatever they can and then just roasting it as dark as they can possibly get away with and then just serving it. Um, it's a real shame. I mean, I used to I used to be very aggravated that Melbourne was the top of the coffee world being a New Zealander and that grated me. Didn't miss um, either here, so word. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, it's it's not looking good. Um, it's not looking good in, in New Zealand, that's for sure. So as we get into the next episode of the podcast, where we're going to look at how to navigate this crisis, um, we, we want to just kind of, I, I want to put a final spin on, on this, like us defining what the, the crisis is by saying that this is going to be a crisis for most but not for all. There are there are always winners in any kind of a crisis, and the people who are going to win from this, it's unpredictable. Uh, and and I I really want to state that because a lot of people are are either doing one of two things: pretending that there's no crisis, or assuming that everybody's going to fail and crash and burn from all of this stuff. Neither of those two things are absolute. And so you've got to take a look at what your situation is. You've got to figure out how prepared are you for this? How well do you understand it? Are you seeking counsel from the right people? Do you understand the health of your business? Do you understand the health of your suppliers and of your customer? Do you know what's happening in your local economy? And if you do answer yes to those things, you're probably really well prepared and you have the agility that's needed to prepare yourself for the crisis that's come. Would you agree, Matt? I think that what you need to be doing is doing a lot of planning and a lot of understanding about where your money is going to come from. You, it's, you can't rely on just the health of an economy anymore. You need to really plan and get everything organize so you can work out how you're doing if if you're doing well or not but about to measure it okay so folks in the next episode and the episode after that we're going to start looking about navigating the crisis so please join us for that in the next couple of episodes peace love and peanut butter have an amazing rest of your day I really hope you enjoyed this episode, friends. Please don't forget to show us some love by subscribing, liking, commenting, and most of all, sharing this podcast with your friends. Check the show notes for links, including our sponsors and our Patreon, and stay tuned for more great conversations on the Daily Coffee Pro by Mapper Forward.